Thanks so much. It's a real pleasure to get to be here with everyone today. Thanks for tuning in. I'm going to go ahead and introduce our panelists and then we'll move on to our opening questions. So first we have Barbara Slavin, who is the director of the Future of Iran Initiative and a non-resident senior fellow at the Atlantic Council, as well as a lecturer in international affairs at George Washington University. As a journalist, she has been senior diplomatic reporter for USA Today, Cairo correspondent for The Economist, and an editor at the New York Times Week in Review. And as a senior fellow at the US Institute of Peace, she researched and wrote the report, Mullahs, Money and Militias, How Iran Exerts Its Influence in the Middle East. We also have Dr. Fuad Ibrahim, who is an editor of Saudi Affairs Magazine, an author of numerous books about Saudi politics and the legacy of Shiism and Shia in Saudi Arabia, and a non-resident fellow at Dawn, Democracy for the Arab World Now a native of Sahwa in Eastern Saudi Arabia. Sorry for the noise. He earned his MA and PhD from the School of Oriental and African Studies. Next, we have Nagar Murtazavi, who is a columnist for The Independent and host of the Iran podcast. She's a frequent media analyst on Iran and US foreign policy, has appeared on CNN, MSNBC, NPR, BBC, France 24, Al Jazeera, and international media outlets. As an Iran native, she was previously a TV anchor for Voice of America, where she hosted a Persian talk show on current affairs. Last but not least, Alex Vatanka is director of the Iran program and a senior fellow at the Middle East Institute. He previously served as a senior analyst at Jane's Information Group in London. A native of Iran, his most recent book is The Battle of the Ayatollahs in Iran, the United States, Foreign Policy and Political Rivalry since 1979. So to go back to Barbara, we're going to have her offer some opening remarks. Uh, well, but, but first, let me just say, in general, this, this panel is a discussion of current, the current state of Iran-Saudi relations. We have here this great uh, panel of experts to comment on that, both bringing perspectives on the internal dynamics within both of these countries, as well as the broader geopolitical context. And in general, my, my main area of interest here is the recent rapprochement we've observed between Riyadh and Tehran, and how we might observe that either continuing or not continuing moving forward. So I'll hand it over to Barbara. Thank you very much, Anel. It's a pleasure to be here. Thanks to the Institute for asking me, and, and I look forward to hearing the comments of my esteemed uh, fellow panelists. Um, I'll just try to set the stage a, a little bit. I, I think uh, all of us would agree that it's a very good development that Iran and Saudi Arabia are talking to each other. Uh, there have been several rounds of talks in Baghdad, other places. Uh, we have not heard, I must uh, confess, much concrete in the way of progress coming out of these talks. I think they're still in kind of the icebreaking stage, uh, but it's an important conversation. So why are we, why are they having this conversation now? Uh, there, I think the, the role or lack thereof of the United States is very important. Uh, starting really in 2019, when uh, there were attacks on Saudi Arabia's main oil facility that were attributed to Iran, uh, we saw that the United States did not respond uh, very vigorously and certainly not very quickly uh, to these attacks. There were other attacks also on shipping in the Persian Gulf. And so I think that the Saudis, uh, you know, woke up and smelled the, the coffee and realized that they uh, were relatively defenseless against these drones and cruise missiles um, and that they really needed to have a conversation with Iran. And of course, there is the backdrop of the Yemen war as well, where Iran has had some support for the Houthi rebels who are continuing to send rockets uh, into Saudi Arabia. Um, so that's, that's sort of the, the backdrop for it. But I think we also have to consider uh, and for those of you who watched the US program 60 Minutes on Sunday, it was a good reminder. We have to remember the rather disastrous path that Saudi Arabia has been on, um, particularly in international affairs, but also to some extent domestic and dealing with domestic opposition uh, since the death of King Abdullah and the ascension of, of uh, the current king and of course his son, uh, the, now the crown prince, Mohammed bin Salman. Um, I mean, it started with the execution of Sheikh Nimr, 
a very prominent uh, Shia Sheikh, Saudi Shia Sheikh, uh, as soon as uh, uh, Salman was on the throne. Um, that led to riots uh, and the break-in of the Saudi embassy and consulates in, in, uh, in Iran, the breaking of formal relations. Um, now, you could argue that the Iranian response was, was excessive, and I think it certainly was. But this was followed very quickly by MBS's decision to attack Yemen and go after the Houthis. Uh, you know, and this is now, what, six years of pointless destruction, and the Houthis are only stronger than they were before. Uh, a few other uh, brilliant uh, ideas of, of MBS, um, the uh, blockade of Qatar, uh, which finally was given up because it pushed Qatar closer to Iran, which was probably not what, what uh, Saudi Arabia intended. Uh, we have the, the imprisonment of many uh, Saudi, prominent Saudis in the Ritz-Carlton and their shakedown for money. Uh, the brief kidnapping of, of uh, Hariri, the prime minister of Lebanon. And of course, the, uh, the brutal and, and grotesque murder of Jamal Khashoggi in a consulate in Istanbul. Uh, the jailing of women activists uh, just before women were given the right to drive in uh, finally in, in Saudi Arabia. Many of these women still face, some are still in prison, some can't leave the country. And then of course the uh, attempt to, attempts to kill Saad al-Jabra, the former number two in the intelligence establishment in Saudi Arabia, and the fact that his children remain jailed uh, as hostages to try to get their father back to Saudi Arabia where I'm sure he would meet a very unpleasant fate. So I think it's fair to say that MBS has had a very long learning curve. And um, the uh, talks with Iran are maybe the beginning of him actually recognizing that his past policies have not succeeded. Um, uh, but uh, given the situation with many dissidents uh, in the country still, uh, I'm not sure we can come to that conclusion yet. Uh, it's a very mixed picture in Saudi Arabia, as I'm sure other panelists will discuss. Uh, obviously, some changes that have been helpful for people and given more personal freedom to a lot of people, but coupled with uh, repression and a kind of paranoid state of, uh, of affairs on the part of MBS, that, that does not bode particularly well. So why don't I just leave it there and, and let my uh, uh, co-panelists fill in the blanks or take any follow-up questions. Thanks so much, Barbara. That was really useful. Um, my first quick follow-up question for you is certainly we've observed a lot of erratic, rash, bad decisions coming out um, of Saudi Arabia. However, I'm curious if you think that MBS may have learned his lesson because a lot of these uh, bad decisions were at this point so a few years old and most of them were also conducted when we had Trump in the White House. So I'm curious if you think he's learned, has he gotten better advisors, or is this just a brief lull before we see more similarly poor decision making? You know, it's hard, it's hard for me to, to gauge, but the fact that there are still prominent political prisoners in the country uh, does not bode well. I mean, a confident ruler can accept criticism. And uh, MBS has shown no capacity to accept criticism uh, on social media or in any other form or fashion. Uh, so, I mean, I know that Jake Sullivan, the US National Security Advisor has recently been to talk to him. I know human rights were raised, uh, but it's going to take a lot for him to, to change the, the very negative image there is of him in the United States. And um, so far, I don't, think, I don't think we're there yet. And then the question I'm going to ask everyone is, do you anticipate that the engagement we're currently observing between Tehran and Riyadh will continue and why or why not? Yes, I think it will continue. I think both countries uh, benefit from it. Uh, Iran is uh, you know, still under sanctions and it's looking to uh, you know, benefit from its neighbors, be able to trade with them to see if they will, will uh, go around the sanctions. And of course, uh, Saudi Arabia still is the custodian of, of the holy uh, sites of Islam and Iranians would like to go back to the Hajj. 
Um, so, and Iran also wants to play a role uh, in the Muslim world, uh, which I think requires uh, a relationship with the, the chief Sunni power uh, in, in, in the world. Um, there are things they can talk about regarding Yemen, regarding Iraq, regarding Syria and Lebanon. So, you know, I think it would, it would be a useful conversation for them. Thank you. We'll turn now to Dr. Fouad Ibrahim to offer his perspective. Dr. Fouad. Oh, I believe you're muted. Is that okay? Okay. First, I would like to express my deep gratitude to Mr. Ali Al Ahmed, the director of Gulf Institute for organizing this panel and special thanks to the moderator, Dr. Shilan. Uh, let me begin by saying that the long-standing tensions between Iran and Saudi Arabia are somewhat complex. However, the view that these tensions are attributed to a sectarian factor is in my view oversimplification and superficial. Uh, though other major factors seem to have been given insufficient at attention, and they may be overshadowed by the sectarian one, particularly in the aftermath of the Saudis' decision in January 2016 to cut off diplomatic ties with Iran as a response to the outrageous protest in, uh, in Iran against the execution of Sheikh Nimr and Nimr. Generally speaking, four decades of different forms of confrontations between the two countries that produce lack of confidence and instability in the region. To shed light on the major factors affecting the relations between Iran and Saudi Arabia, I should mention three major factors, the geopolitical factor, economic factor, and security factor. With regard to the geopolitical factor, it could be noted that throughout the last four decades, especially after the Iranian revolution in 1979, the political landscape in the region has dramatically changed. There appear two camps, the allies of the United States on one camp and its enemies on the other. Originally, the dispute between Saudi Arabia and Iran uh, revolves partly around their conflicting re uh, roles and region regional uh, politics. Their attempts uh, to promote mutual understanding, respect, and tolerance, let alone interest, have been unsuccessful. In the famous interview with the Atlantic magazine on March 10th, 2016, President Obama blamed his allies, the Saudis, for not sharing the region with Iran. Obama comments on the shortcomings of America's allies who act more like free riders, as he terms, suggesting that he is preserving and enhancing US power, not diminishing it, by refusing to wage unnecessary and un unwinnable wars in the fleeing states of the Middle East. On the other hand, Iran's revolutionary rhetoric was a fear provoking for some Gulf states. More importantly for them, Iran's grow a growing influence in the region represent an exceptional challenge to the, to, to the Saudis and, her allies, and their allies. Also, both parties now, the Iranian and Saudis, now are at a, a historical juncture where all convictions and accounts should be abandoned and replaced by win-win equation. So far, the six rounds of of dialogue between Iran and Saudi Arabia are meant to establish a new stage in the region. It ought to start with the escalation of the tensions and then preparing the ground for a wide range of engagements, including first and foremost resolving the ongoing war in Yemen. Yet I should say that it is very early to talk about breakthroughs, as the meeting is still at what Saudi foreign minister has termed exploratory stage. So it is not wise to speak about the end of dispute or complete reconciliation and resumption of the diplomatic relations. There are 
deeply rooted controversial issues between the two countries, which need years to tackle. However, the continuation of dialogue imply, implies that both, both countries are determined to seriously address all disputed issues. One big fruit of the dialogue would, would be the improvement of relations between Iran and the Gulf states on one side and Saudi with Iran's allies on the other. In general, the ongoing meetings would not be possible without first the transformation of US original strategy leading to a massive change of plans aimed at encountering the challenges in the Eurasia. With the United States laws of interest in the region, the Saudis and other Gulf states have realized that it is the right time to diversify alliances and to, and to put an end to the longest standing tensions in the region and to manage their disputes in order to save to safeguard their thrones. Second, the implication and consequences of the revival of nuclear uh, deal with Iran. For Saudis, for the Saudis, the deal, this deal will be as a master key for Iran to reach out the world markets and to build the strategic relations with the Saudi traditional, with traditional Western allies. Third, the turmoil of Saudi oil war in Yemen as a major concern to be tackled with minimum damage. According to reliable sources, the first three rounds of negotiation, the Saudis asked the Iranian to exert their influence to persuade their allies in Yemen to bring an end to the war. Four, the, the US sanctions on Iran for four decades caused catastrophic damage to Iran's economy and development in, in, in general. Though Iran has made significant pro progress in certain industries such as military, medicine, agriculture, and energy, major sectors such as aviation, technology, and monetary were heavily affected. Finally, enmity is not inevitable. And in a globalizing world with, with all its manifestations, states are obliged to reassess their attitude, priorities, and short and long-term objectives. Most importantly is that they should have the courage to address the most controversial issues, such as regional roles, security concern, and economy interest. Thank you. Dr. Fouad, thanks so much for these comments. I, I'd like to go back to the, the very first thing you opened with. I agree with you that attributing the, the tension between Iran and Saudi Arabia to sectarianism is an oversimplification. In general, I think that likely sectarian tensions reflect the geopolitical rivalry or result from it rather than being the driver of it. But at the same time, we know that sectarian tension is real and is experienced by people in their daily lives. And so I'm, I'm curious if you could perhaps comment on, was a two part question. So one is, do you think that perhaps social media has been involved in perhaps making sectarian tensions worse because people can express them and they're sort of experienced online as well as perhaps in person. And then the second part is if we do observe an increased uh, effort to reduce tensions between Iran and Saudi Arabia, how do you think the leaderships of these two countries will be able or will they be able to address some of this sectarianism again, which may be expressed online? Uh, first, uh, actually, I. I'm not underestimating the, the sectarian factor. Uh, sectarian, sectarianism is always there in the regional politics. Uh, but I cannot, at the same time, I cannot you know, give, um, like, an I cannot exaggerate the role of sectarianism uh, when it comes to political interest. Historically speaking, Saudi Arabia, since the, 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 the inception of the Saudi state in 1744, there was a problem with the, with the Ottoman, Ottoman Empire on, uh, on, religion, on, on political uh, ground. And they, then they had the problem with, with Jamal Abdel Nasser 
on national uh, ground. And then they have the, a, a problem with the Muslim Brotherhood uh, after the, uh, the, the revolution in, in, in Egypt in 2011. And so, so it is not about, although I know it is sectarianism could, could, uh, could play manipulative role uh, when, when it comes to regional, because it is the, the, the conflict between Iran and Saudi Arabia um, cannot, be, uh, cannot be revealing the, 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 the real uh, factors that behind it. Because I'm sure now, the, when, when they decided to avoid sectarianism, they start to communicate and to, deep, to approach all the conflicting issues between the two, the two countries. So I, I'm sure when they decide, they can abort the, 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 the impact of sectarianism. But when they decide to, uh, to go into conflict, the Saudis will, will go back and will, ha will have this sectarian uh, card to be played in the end of Islam. Thanks. And the question for everyone, do you expect that the rapprochement will continue or not? For me? Yes. Yeah, actually, I think, I think all the indications suggest that um, the, the meetings or the dialogue between Iran and Saudi Arabia will continue. Uh, because I think the, both they have common concerns and both they have common interests. And they, they, they have issues to be tackled uh, collectively and um, I know the Saudis uh, try to give a blind eye for the, the role of uh, Iran in the region in the past years, but now I think they became more realistically uh, dealing with these issues. So I think they will, uh, they will continue uh, dialogue with Iran. Thank you. Turning now to Negar. Thank you. Thank you so much for um, thanks to the Institute for holding this important and I think timely event. And um, thanks to Anel for moderating and hello to my fellow panelists and to everyone who's tuned in today. Um, I just first I wanted to make a comment about the sectarian divide and I agree with uh, Dr. Brahim that's a more of a simplified explanation, um, something that frankly we also see so much in uh, Western corners to sort of um, put this rivalry, this um, what I think is a very much strategic and about um, power and influence in the region between the two major powers Iran and Saudi Arabia. And I don't also think that the sectarian divide explains it all. The two countries do ride the wave of sectarianism and they obviously try to recruit allies um, from the two different sects, Shias and Sunnis. But I think this uh, simplifying the Iran-Saudi rivalry to a sectarian divide, Iran wanting to go for a pure Shia crescent in the region and Saudi Arabia representing all Sunnis um, is uh, not completely accurate. I think Iran is more of a revolutionary state, has been in the region trying to um, sort of uh, disrupt the status quo with a new outlook and they have succeeded in pushing their um, power and influence and as a new hegemon and Saudi Arabia sees itself more of an old guard and um, with support the main difference between the two is that Iran has garnered support from many non-state actors in a very different way the proxies that uh, they have this axis of resistance basically as they call resistance to the west to imperialism and to these uh, regional powers and Saudi Arabia has relied more on state uh, support, especially with the US and the West. But moving to um, the current state, and I'm going to talk a little bit about um, this new administration in Tehran. There's a new president, Ibrahim Raisi, a hardline president, very controversial. Um, he brings with him a hardline cabinet, um, a fairly hardline foreign minister, Hussein Amir Abdullah, and all of this. Um, is going, has, and will uh, change Iran's foreign policy direction. But 
I think as far as uh, engagement with Saudi Arabia and the taunt with Saudi Arabia, um, this new administration, the hardliners basically consolidating power in Tehran might actually be a positive um, uh, factor for Iran-Saudi engagement. First of all, um, Hussein Amir Abdullahian, from a technical viewpoint, his expertise is the Arab world. He's been a deputy foreign minister in the Iranian foreign ministry focusing mostly on the Arab world. Um, and he's also uh, been very close to Iran's IRGC and more militaristic factions that we basically know run Iran's <laughs> regional policy um, decisions, Qasem Soleimani before he was killed and the new uh, Quds Force um, apparatus. And he's had good relations with the so-called axis of resistance, the various proxies uh, that Iran has in the region. And even under um, Javad Zaif, the previous foreign minister, Amir Abdullah was sort of his go-to man when it came to regional policies, to relations with the Quds Force inside Iran, Qasem Soleimani, and also with this um, uh, proxy forces across the region, the non-state actors. So I think the way I can explain it or simplify it is that the regional file has sort of been elevated from a deputy foreign minister level to a foreign minister level. And this is not great news for Iran's engagement with the West, for the JCPOA, because I think engagements with the West and especially with the US are going to be more complicated and more difficult with the new administration, with the hardliners, with this faction that is very ideologically anti engagement with the United States, but this consolidation of power by the hardliners might actually help Iran's um, uh, and Iran and Saudi's engagement and into uh, moving into a direction of reducing tensions. And as, as Fouad was saying, it's not going to be completely uh, resolved as far as relations are very important and difficult, complex uh, differences between the two countries that have caused tensions over the years, but I think they can move into a direction of detente. And the important thing is that this is something that uh, the Iranians have wanted for a long time and different factions within the Iranian political system under the uh, years of Hassan Rouhani, more of a moderate in Iran's political structure. Um, there have been talks, at least the public messaging from Tehran was that they wanted to um, resolve uh, differences and reduce tensions with Saudi Arabia. During the Trump years, the dynamic was a little bit um, difficult because Saudi Arabia felt like they have unconditional support from the Trump administration, Jared Kushner himself, Donald Trump, and that sort of um, shifted the balance and gave a lot of confidence to the Saudis. Um, but with the new administration, the Biden administration, the outlook from Washington towards the region is very different. Uh, Saudi Arabia doesn't have that kind of a blank check or unconditional support from Washington anymore, especially when it comes to the war in Yemen, which is a main point of contention between Tehran and uh, Riyadh. Um, the U.S. also, the Democrats at least, are looking into disengaging from the region, pulling away more from the region, and that's also not good news for Saudi Arabia, other Arab countries in the Persian Gulf who've enjoyed this kind of of uh, strong support from the United States. And uh, I think all of these have sort of uh, pushed Saudi Arabia more into a direction of trying to engage and resolve uh, tensions with Tehran. And we see that in their public messaging too. It's, it's been, uh, it looks like they've shifted gears in the past few years from the Trump years um, that we, we've heard MBS when he first <coughs> um, consolidated power talking about Iran's Supreme Leader Khamenei being worse than Hitler and, you know, having to be done with, dealt with in that way. But now we see the public messaging um, shifting a little bit. And it, I think it's a signal to a realization by Saudi Arabia that they need to move more towards a um, uh, direction of detente and reducing tensions with Iran. We've also heard from Saudi officials uh, that they want to move into a direction of uh, zero tension or no tension with their neighbors. And I also think uh, one other factor that uh, some people talk about and ask me a lot is uh, the, that the Abraham Accords as was first promoted under the Trump administration, that's going to be a new access against Iran, sort of a rivalry against this axis of resistance that Iran has. That didn't really 
um, bring as much food as they expected. Saudi Arabia never ended really joining this officially. And um, I don't think that kind of support from an Israel perspective is going to be something that would um, give confidence to the Saudis. And um, eventually, I think in the Yemen war, uh, at the beginning of the war, the Saudis has had a lot of confidence and a lot more support. And they assumed that they're going to win this war very quickly and very easily. And I think over the years, the Houthis, the Iran allies have uh, proved that they, they can have uh, exert influence in that region and that um, eventually I think this is a main, um, a key sticking point uh, that Tehran and Riyadh would have to sort of um, resolve when it comes to their detente. It's one of the issues that from Tehran's viewpoint, they can't completely abandon the Houthis uh, in their uh, engagement with the Saudis. And from the Saudi viewpoint, they sort of have to accept that the Houthis um, are there and they're, they're not going to be completely um, defeated in the Yemen war. So I think these are all um, issues that the two sides um, have been looking at. And from an internal perspective um, and attaching this back to the JCPOA, I have uh, less hope for a revival of the JCPOA. Unfortunately, I, were, I was more optimistic when the Biden administration first came in. I think there was a golden window of opportunity that they missed. And now it's just going to be more difficult. And if that revival doesn't happen, I think the Iranians will eventually, and with the hardliners in power, there will be a shift to the east and to the region. So the silver lining of uh, that uh, failure of, or the, the lack of diplomacy or success on the JCPOA would actually mean more of an incentive for Tehran um, to try to resolve um, tensions or diff differences with its neighbors. If the JCPOA moves forward still, that doesn't mean that it would uh, negatively uh, impact Iran's engagements with Saudi Arabia. I think in parallel, this is something that the hardliners, the Supreme Leader Khamenei have wanted um, in their own way, but they wanted this detente with Saudi Arabia for, uh, for a while. But if the JCPOA does happen, I think it would actually be more of a push to the Saudis to try to uh, come closer to uh, Tehran and try to meet them halfway. Um, I'll stop there, but I'm happy to answer any questions by Anil or the audience. Thanks so much, Nagar. Uh, I would, there's a lot to follow up on there, but I, I think the one I was particularly interested in following up right now, you were pointing out that the Abraham Accords were seen as initially intended as a sort of anti-Iran coalition, but then that we didn't see Saudi Arabia join. Um, but I'm curious if you think that that the Saudis would never join. I mean, thus far we've heard MBS essentially say, well, as long as my dad's on the throne, he's not gonna be willing to join, but he's sort of hinted that maybe he would join. Um, and we, we also recently saw uh, the, on the, the anniversary of the signing of the accords, the US holding this meeting with the UAE and Israel, and again, Israel indicating its willingness to perhaps pursue military action against Iran. Um, so again, I'm, I'm just curious about the extent to which you think that the Abraham Accords um, first, that the Saudi Arabia certainly wouldn't join, or that it might not still uh, behave as a sort of anti-Iran coalition in the region? Well, I think what I meant, Anel, was that the Trump administration made a really big slash about these accords, and there was this fear that this was going to be uh, maybe even once the US disengages from the region, that this new alliance is going to be something that would stand up to Iran's um, you know, hegemony in the region. And I don't think that has happened until now, as we know, Saudi Arabia hasn't joined. I don't know what the chances are because from their viewpoint, they also have their own allies. There's the Palestinian issue. It's very big for Saudi Arabia. And the cost of doing something like that, that kind of a public detente with Israel for Saudi Arabia, until now, it seems like the calculation is that the cost of something like that would have been very high. Um, and we see it hasn't happened. Would it happen in the future? Maybe, I don't know. I don't want to say never, but um, it's, it's just that with the US adamant about disengaging from the region and nothing really replacing that presence so far, um, 
I think Saudi Arabia has felt that they're not going to be that kind of a military and strategic support as they had in the past. And especially uh, during the Trump years, that was sort of a blank check. Um, and then as Barbara pointed with the human rights file, the a very bad PR around the Khashoggi murder and all of that, I think they have gotten weaker and weaker as far as their unconditional support with, uh, from Washington. And then again, you, you indicated this already that you think that the rapprochement does reflect the, the fact that the US has indicated that they would like to be less engaged with the region. But just to lay it out very clearly, do you think that the rapprochement will continue in the future or? I think I think it will continue unless, unless something um, very unusual happens. But um, just just to add that I think that the U.S. Um, disengagement is one factor. It also seems like in the uh, Iraq, um, the mediation in Iraq has made some headway. That was also an important factor, and also just the geopolitics of the region, regardless of U.S. presence or not between um, Tehran and Riyadh. There's all of these factors coming together, but definitely US disengaging from the region, I think uh, has an important role in this. And it looks like that's moving forward. So I think the rapprochement between Iran and Saudi Arabia will also continue or the engagement. Thank you. Finally, turning to Alex, the floor is yours. Well, thank you, Anel. Thank you very much. Thanks to the Institute. Great to be with you. Looking forward to the <clears throat> conversation. Um, I was asked to um, focus on the debate in Tehran, which I intend to do. Um, but let me just point out, uh, and I think uh, this might be an important point. Um, Iran and Saudi Arabia have had a break in diplomatic relations over the last 90 some years on three occasions. Once in the 40s, which lasted three years. Once in from 88 to 91, again lasted three years. And this time around, since, since 2016, we're all in, already into the fifth year. And that in itself tells you quite a bit about the depth of, of suspicion that exists on both sides. Five years of no diplomatic relations, almost no trade, although there are signs that might change I think we should really be clear, uh, uh, you know, um, open about the depth of suspicion here and that this is not gonna be something that you can uh, over uh, undo uh, the bad blood overnight. If they are committed to it, which requires political commitment, this is a long haul. This is a, not an issue of weeks and months, but years, perhaps even decades to really create the sort of solid foundations for neighborly relations where Iran and Saudi Arabia can perhaps uh, you know, share the region or coexist peacefully. Speaking of political commitment, you know, last time you had someone who took a personal gamble on the Iranian side, and I would say the same happened on the Saudi side with then uh, Crown Prince Abdullah. These two men took a personal um, stake by meeting each other, by, by having a um, verbal fight to begin with, but a candid one. Uh, in the course of a number of years before, by the mid 1990s, you actually had something that started looking like a, a process of rapprochement. My point is, it takes political will uh, to do it. I'm not sure we're there yet. I'm not sure uh, Ayatollah Ali Khamenei can be Hashemi Rafsanjani of the 1990s. Hashemi Rafsanjani's worldview 20 some years after the 1979 revolution was. Iran cannot be an island. You've got to integrate in the region, into the world. So he wanted to go out there and make um, partnerships. And you know, he was willing to take the most um, controversial files. Uh, the, I think it, everything, uh, the US file, he, he tried that. The, the Saudi file certainly, and he succeeded to some extent. The exception was Israel, the issue of Israel that he didn't touch. I, I would really be uh, doubtful that Ayatollah Khamenei would uh, be willing to go there to put his neck out and say so. I mean, I know he sort of, you know, if you want to read between the lines, Ayatollah Khamenei always talks about, you know, we will be ready to have relations with everyone uh, as soon as they, you know, meet, um, meet us halfway and so forth. But he could actually speed up the process significantly by being far more explicit 
uh, by coming out and, and, and reaching out to the Saudis and forget about some of the things that have been said in recent years. Obviously, I don't think that, you know, liking him to Hitler uh, was going to make Mohammed bin Salman a, a popular figure in the Supreme Leader's office. But let's not forget, Mohammed bin Salman's uncle, King Fahd, also liked Khomeini to Hitler just about two decades earlier, three decades earlier, and they got over it. But it requires political commitment, and I'm just not sure we're there yet. Look, you've got three centers of power in the Islamic Republic that matter when it comes to foreign policy. It's the office of the Supreme Leader, it's the Revolutionary Guards, which arguably is the most important play when it comes to the regional files, but they're actually the guys on the ground doing the, the, the business of running uh, the files of, of the Ansar Allah, the Houthis in Yemen, the, the Hashti Shabis in Iraq, the, the pro-Assad forces in Syria, Hezbollah in Lebanon, Hamas, Islamic Jihad. I mean, these are not run by the foreign ministry in Tehran. These are all in the uh, control of the Quds Force, the Revolutionary Guards, external branch for operations. Uh, there's, you know, Raisi becoming president just three months ago means nothing. Raisi does not have much of a political mandate. He got this job because he's not going to, you know, uh, endanger anyone. Um, he is someone they trust. He's entirely beholden to Khamenei and the Revolutionary Guards. He hasn't said a single word that suggests to me he has a vision for foreign policy. I mean, Hassan Rouhani didn't do much in the eight years he was in power, nor did Mahmoud Ahmadinejad. But at least they can't, came out and articulated something that you know, suggested they might have thought about foreign policy. Raisi doesn't even pretend that he has thought about it. And I suspect he's not even gonna travel out of Iran because that's not where he's supposed to be doing his work. So uh, I suspect because of that, you can expect continuity more or less. If the Saudis turn around tomorrow, say to Iran, our price for you and us to have a good relationship is that you cut out the proxy model, what the Iranians call forward defense. Our price is that you cut out the, the Houthis or the Hashd al-Shabi, you, you, you know, will roll out, roll back from the region. Of course, the, the message from the Iranians will be a, a, a solid no. Ayatollah Khamenei would rather go to his grave than at this point roll back, because why, why would he want to accept defeat? They feel that being in the region for them is a projection of power. Um, so what can be done in turn is that you, you have the conditions, and I think a previous panelists uh, did touch on it, and I agree, the conditions are such that you, know, you might be able to, to have a compromise, meet each other halfway. So Saudi Arabia, instead of saying roll back from Iraq or, or Yemen, say Iran, help us stabilize the situation. So compromises can be made, uh, and they've done it in the past. And Saudi Arabia and Iran have made compromises in the past, even when things were very, um, you know, very hot. Uh, the relations were very tense. So, but again, I want to go back to the issue of political commitment. Uh, and if they, uh, there is a political commitment in Tehran and in Riyadh, and if it's genuine, you know, you could make the argument that Saudi Arabia today is going towards Iran because you know they're fearful the United States is kind of leaving the region, which I think is exaggerated, but I don't think the way U.S. pulled out of Afghanistan helps the U.S. image in terms of its commitment to stay the course. But just say the Saudis believe that they have to talk to Iran because the United States leads. That's not the best way of, of tackling the issue of a genuine rapprochement by Iran. You should look at it irrespective of who's in the White House or what American policy for the Middle East is. You should look at it in terms of this is a relationship between two powerful states in the Middle East, arguably the two most powerful, certainly in terms of land size and population, the size of the economies. There's a lot that Iran and Saudi Arabia can do for each other, and the, benefit, the benefits of that will impact the entire region. And the opposite is true. The opposite can be true, and we've seen it the last 20 years. I mean, the worst aspect of the Iranian-Saudi um, uh, you know, uh, rivalry was the, when they were fueling the sectarian fire. Um, I, I, I am delighted to see that the sectarian tensions have um, subsided. That's wonderful. Um, but I, I hope they can, you know, do away with it permanently. And, and um, you know, I see mixed signals on, on that front. I see, you know, the media war of words between the Saudi side and Iranian side still goes up and down. There are days where, you know, there are no attacks, and then there are days where you see the attacks re-emerging. I, I, I just see overall, when I look at this relationship, a one of both sides, and I think Iran and Saudi Arabia are not alone in this. Across the region, there's a realization that these uh, open-ended proxy conflicts and the competition for influence has nothing but drained their state coffers and their 
come at the detriment of their people. Instead of providing basic services for Iranians, for Saudis, money is being spent in sort of chasing uh, foreign policy projects. In the case of Saudi Arabia, and, and I heard everyone uh, comment that, uh, in terms of where Saudi Arabia is going, and I'm not a Saudi expert, I won't talk about internal Saudi affairs, but I think one thing that you can certainly point to, and I think that is a positive, is that the Saudis uh, seem to, at least for now, and that might change, but seem to have decided to be a bit more inward looking, to do a bit more nation building at home and less uh, in, you know, involvement in the region. They are clearly very keen to get themselves out of Yemen. Um, and I think that's understandable. They don't have much success to point to, frankly. It's been a, a disaster for Saudi Arabia. I mean, any, anybody who says the Yemen war has been a plus for Saudi Arabia, I, I think that's just uh, difficult to defend. Um, and yet, they want to hear from the Iranians that they don't intend to turn Yemen into what South Lebanon is, you know, stronghold for pro-Iranian um, entity that can threaten Saudi security. So, but again, that is doable. That's where exactly where Iran and Saudi Arabia need to reassure each other. So um, while I think it's going to be a hard uh, path going forward, and right now, uh, you know, there, we, we see this zigzag up and down, we're not sure, uh, but I think there is a path forward and we've seen it in our in our lives, literally in our lives, we've seen Iran and Saudi Arabia come back from the brink, and I'm sure they can do it again with the right political determination to do so. Thanks so much, Alex, in particular sort of offering a different perspective. And where I, I hoped you could expand a little bit is you said that you think that this idea that the US is going to be playing a smaller role or wants to get out of the region, you say that you think that's exaggerated. Could you say a little bit more about why you feel that's been sort of overblown? I mean, I think here in Washington, DC, you know, um, the headline of, of the year seems to be that the United States cares about China. Everything's going to ship out of the Middle East and go towards, uh, you know, defending US interest in the Pacific. And I think, you know, surely that makes long term sense if, if China is going where it's going and relations remain as tense as they are, that's that's easy to foresee that there will be a, a diversion of, of US interest uh, away from not just the Middle East, but other regions and more focus on China. But that doesn't mean that the United States is going to be replaced overnight in terms of being the prominent or preeminent, um, you know, hard power power in the Middle East. And nobody right now in the Middle East has the kind of hard power projection the United States has. And that's a good thing. That's a good thing for the, I mean, the Iranians wouldn't see it this way, but I would say if you're sitting in Tehran and you want sort of a transition to something better, and if you give up on the idea that that transition at the end of it means United States need to lead the region, because that's the hardliners rhetoric in Tehran. If they get away from that rhetoric, if they accept the fact that almost all their neighbors have good relations with the United States or a working relationship with the United States, the United States is a power to stay in the Middle East. And Iran, instead of seeking to push the US out, should look for ways to coexist with the US because that's what the neighbors of Iran, which Iran desperately wants to deal with, want to see. They want Iran to accept the fact that the United States uh, for whatever reason, is a source of assurance for countries like UAE, Saudi Arabia, Israel, and so forth. So I, I think, you know, this is this is a judgment call in Tehran. This is when you sort of say the axis of resistance talk and the United States should leave the region, all of that actually undermines what Iran is trying to do with, with its own neighborhood policy, which is to reduce tensions across the board, including with countries like Saudi Arabia. I hope there will be a rethink. The hardliners in Tehran are the last people you would think would do that because their bread and butter is anti-Americanism. And yet, for the survival of the Islamic Republic and creating space for themselves to be able to sort of devote, uh, devote more attention to the desperate economic situation for the Iranian people, th those are exactly the tough decisions they could make and take the country in a different direction. I think the whole region and including the Iranian people uh, would, would love to see that and benefit from it. Thanks, that makes a lot of sense. And I, I know you, you've already said that you're a bit skeptical of the sort of the level of the rapprochement, but if, if you could just kind of say very clearly whether you think, whether you expect that this level of engagement will continue or 
you know, it's kind of, we've seen as much as is going to come out of it and this is as far as it's gonna go. Well, listen, I, I'll say two things now. One is I want to see deep introspection, not just in Riyadh, but also in Tehran. Now I'm not someone who follows Saudi affairs, I follow Iranian affairs. And when I look at what the Raisi government is saying in terms of having achieved much in its Saudi policy, I see a lot of eagerness. The Saudi government, I'm sorry, the Iranian government, uh, Amir Abdullahian and the likes keep you know, saying that we've made massive uh, progress with the Saudis. But I suspect, I fear, that's just, that's just for the purpose of saying they're having a success. When I look at the hard debate, were they actually talking about the things that did, they did on the Iranian side, let's leave the Saudis out of it. I'm sure they did wrong uh, things as well. But on the Iranian side, where is admission of guilt? We talked about, I don't know which of the fellow uh, panelists talked about the execution of Sheikh uh, Nimr back in 2016, which resulted in the embassy of Saudi Arabia and Tehran being torched, right? Everyone in Iran knows that was a mistake including, you know, you, you heard that in the last presidential debates in Iran. Everyone accepts that this was something that shouldn't have been done. And yet, is there a debate in Tehran where people say, well, who are these people? Who are these rogue elements that somehow came from nowhere and torched the Saudi embassy? Because they came from somewhere. There's a faction in the Islamic Republic that was behind it. That's the sort of conversation you need to have in Iran to talk about you know, foreign policy of Iran cannot be hijacked by one faction in the regime to the detriment of the national security, just because that faction, you know, fears a cer certain foreign policy outcome, which is exactly what happened when, uh, when they torched that um, Saudi embassy in 2016. So that's one thing. You need genuine, genuine debate in Iran and in Saudi Arabia, and they need to sort of be frank about it. They need to put all the issues that are difficult on the table instead of sort of talking about, yes, we've had four rounds of talks since April and there have been good talks in Baghdad. That's not going to cut it. You want to be explicit about what are the issues. Point it out, Yemen, sectarians, Iraq, whatever it is, point it out. Make it very clear that this is going to be a long haul, but that you know there's a willingness to at least try. The other thing I say, and I'll stop there now, is if you're Saudi Arabia, you invest everything in Donald Trump. He comes in, you believe maximum pressure is gonna bring the Islamic Republic down, and it doesn't. And Donald Trump doesn't really try that hard, at least not from a Saudi perspective. So why would the Saudis try another American maximum pressure? Why would they think that uh, you know, uh, their best bet is to sort of follow the American lead instead of taking um, you know, a handle on these, uh, the issue of Iran themselves bilaterally? Everybody else in the neighborhood, pretty much with the exception of Israel, has one uh, you know, set of working relations with Iran or another. And I think the Saudis didn't want to be the odd one out. And you know, um, if Saudi Arabia uh, continues, as I said, it's going to be a tough, tough, tough dialogue. Uh, but this is something they can do and they can own it. They can control it the way they couldn't control, say, the maximum pressure campaign, which ultimately didn't deliver what Saudi Arabia had hoped it would deliver. Thanks so much, Alex. I think that's really useful for us to consider. So there are a lot of follow-up questions that, that I'd like to ask, but I, I think I want to make sure we get audience questions in. Um, so one in particular, I believe, came from Hassan, had to do with the regional implications regarding an arms race, especially nuclear proliferation, if the JCPOA is not successfully resuscitated. Um, and he asked, do you think Iran might leave the non-proliferation treaty and how might that affect Saudi intentions regarding its nuclear program? I would add that other countries in the region would, would likely be interested in acquiring a nuclear weapon as well from the UAE to Qatar. Um, so I see Barbara nodding, maybe I'll, I'll turn to Barbara first, but would love others thoughts if they'd like to weigh in about um, the possibility of, of an arms race and especially a nuclear arms race. Yeah, I, I think that this prospect is one of the things that hopefully will get Iran back into the JCPOA or into some sort of other nuclear agreement because they are very well aware that the Saudis have started a covert nuclear program. Uh, I believe they, they have a reactor. I believe there is some yellow cake uh, we've seen some oblique reports. It's not under IAEA inspection. Uh, the UAE has the first functioning nuclear power plant um, in, in, 
uh, across from Iran and the Persian Gulf. It is under safeguards, but of course uh, the Emiratis are gaining knowledge that could be used in a nuclear program if Iran uh, you know, advances toward, toward an actual weapon. So I, I hope not, I think not. Um, I don't think it serves Iran's interests. And when Iranians say that their defense doctrine relies much more on their partners like Hezbollah and so on, uh, and their missile program, rather than on nuclear weapons, I, I would like to take them at their word. But their their developments so far are pretty worrisome. I mean, they're going very, very far uh, in their program right now. Thanks, Barbara. Did anyone else want to weigh in on thoughts on the possibility of, of an arms race? Dr. Fouad? I think you're muted. Oh, Dr. Fouad, we can't hear you. I think at lower left is should be the mute and unmute button. There you go. Uh, yes, uh, regarding arms race in, in the region, I don't think neither Iran nor the Saudis are in favor of uh, this game because it is very dangerous for both countries. So I think th they know that building uh, military in, in, in the region will not uh, solve the problem because they are in, in a stage where they need to reassure each other that they are serious, they are uh, honest, uh, they are, uh, uh, are going through uh, all the, the dis disputed issues. So, uh, and at the same time, I don't believe that the Iranians are in favor of nuclear weapons. I believe the, the Supreme Leader, and I, I don't think Iran will go uh, to, um, to have a nuclear weapons. <laughs> at the same time, I, I just want to mention as uh, what Alex has said, if he depicts uh, the Supreme Leader as uh, a hardliner in Iran, I think this is a big mistake. I think he is more, uh, uh, maybe uh, more, more than Rafsanjani in, in, in some issues because he, he, he is not in favor of provoking tensions in the region. And he called even the Shia, uh, Shia communities in the Gulf to, uh, to coexist and to live in peace and to do not uh, go too far in their uh, in their protests for their uh, legitimate rights in the region. That's why the uh, I remember the, the 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 Lebanese Sheikh Mohammed Mahdi Shamsuddin, who 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 calls the the Shias to to uh, to coexist and to to be in harmony with the, with the governments and and the in the region. I think this is the the same. Uh, the same view that the Supreme Leader adopts. So I don't think, uh, even th there's no distinction between Supreme Leader, Raisi, Ray and the, the, the Revolutionary Guard. I think they all follow the, what the, the religious uh, Supreme Leader says. And so uh, there's no, and that's why I think the Saudis are happy this time with the Iranians because there is no distinction as used to be when, when, when Rouhani was uh, the president. So I, I think and, and, uh, today, I think the right time for the Saudis to, to engage uh, fully and uh, sincerely with Iranians because they, they know that they will reach uh, an agreement with the Iranians. Thanks Dr. Fahad. Um, I'm going to pause here for a minute because we have Ali Al Ahmed, the director of the program, who uh, is wasn't here at the opening, is here with us now, and had indicated he'd like to offer his perspective as well. I don't know if uh, he wanted to speak on the nuclear question or sort of broader issues, but I'll I'll hand the mic to him. Thank you, everyone, for uh, jo joining and uh, having. I'm listening to this great uh, panel. 
Uh, thank you, uh, if, every one of you. Uh, I uh, was hoping to get uh, a Saudi perspective. I really tried hard and uh, um, I failed. Um, uh, so I, I'm going to just uh, uh, give some points uh, of perspective of Dr. Mohammed Salemi, who I tried to get on, on, the, on the panel, uh, who's a Saudi. Uh, and runs a, a, an organization uh, in Jeddah uh, in, in Riyadh, uh, is Saudi Iranian or Iranian study center. So uh, he published an article in the Middle East Institute. And I think what we have here is, is basically another, is the opposite perspective of the Iranian side where uh, it's all Iran's fault. Um, uh, so I wanted to make sure that this perspective is included uh, uh, saying that the Saudi perspective is that Iran has been doing bad things and Saudi Arabia has been trying to do good things. Uh, uh, so my, my, my question and comment is uh, both countries have been working sort of to expand their own footprint in the region and allying with uh, either with their allies regionally or uh, for Saudi Arabia to have the US and the UK uh, supporting uh, and you now Israel supporting their um, their, their position vis-a-vis -vis Iran. Uh, so my, my question is, how is this happening? Uh, I mean, you have the UK, the the uh, the the Americans and the Israelis uh, who might benefit from uh, uh, an Iranian Saudi conflict. Uh, so what would be more, you know, what would convince the Saudis to to end that to to deal with with Iran as a neighbor with all the problems between the two countries. And thank you again for, the, for participating. Thanks, Ali. Was that directed at any particular panelist? Uh, it's uh, up for grabs. So. If I may, very quickly, and now look, uh, good to see you, Ali, and thanks for the uh, for your comment and the question. I mean, I want to go back very quickly to, to two points. Number one, I agree. The idea that um, Iran's responsible for everything that goes wrong in the, in the Middle East is a gross oversimplification of what's happening. I mean, nor are the Iranians the only ones who have used proxy groups uh, in their effort to expand their influence. But the point is, if you go back to 1979, the Ayatollah Khomeini revolution is about shaking things up, is about questioning the legitimacy of, her, of other ruling states. It's about, you know, and, and Khomeini used religious terminology, Tawud. I mean, you all remember the word Tawud was something that we all picked up as children that we had never heard of it before. It was an Arabic word, you know, that you were a legitimate ruling class and you had to go. And that created fear. That created fear in the neighboring states. I don't think the Saudis woke up in 1979 when the Shah was gone and they had their worst day then. They had their worst day when they realized that the people who took over from the Shah had these revolutionary uh, ideas about rearranging everything essentially in, in, in the Middle East. So let's not forget how this fight essentially started. But I agree with you. The Saudis have also been part of the problem in terms of some of the, certainly from Tehran's perspective, from Tehran's perspective, here's, here's what they see. Um, and I'm not defending, obviously, the Islamic Republic, uh, uh, but they're, from their perspective, Saudi Arabia is part of an undeclared war against the Islamic Republic that Saudi Arabia is, is trying to bring the regime down or has done uh, a lot uh, in that, uh, in the, you know, on that front in, in recent years. Um, but that's not where we are today. And that's the, that's the hopeful side uh, that Saudi Arabia will, has now decided uh, on its own will that it wants to go in a different direction and Iran, Iran should welcome it. I agree with Ali, the whole neighborhood would benefit, the entire Middle East would benefit from less money being spent on military uh, programs and more in terms of creating job for the young, which are the major demographic in the region. They need jobs. If you wanna, if you wanna prevent extremism, you wanna keep people busy in good jobs and give them education, opportunities in life. And it, it requires all the states in the neighborhood to be part of a dialogue and unfortunately for very too long now, Middle East has been chasing this zero sum uh, competition that you know, uh, your neighbor has to be a loser for you to be a winner. And that, that's just the wrong mentality. I think everybody in the region clearly uh, can benefit from, from you know, the, the boat lifting up for everyone. So 
that's just the hopeful part in me. Um, I love to hear what others have to say. Thanks, Alex. We haven't heard from Nagar for a little bit, so I'd invite her to weigh in if she's interested. Sure, I agree. I think um, regional tensions have various players and each side, the different sides seem to want to blame or shift all the blame um, on their rivals. It's been a trend on the Iranian side, the Saudi side. And I think as far as uh, the will or the incentive to continue this path of engagement and reduce tensions eventually, they won't, I don't think Iran and Saudi Arabia can resolve all of their differences overnight, as I said. But I think to reduce tensions and get, move towards a point of less instead of more tensions, um, the, the various different factors, including US disengagement from the region is playing a, a very um, important role. And also the change of administration in Washington, the, from an administration uh, like Donald Trump uh, that had a very different relationship with Saudi Arabia uh, to an administration that is now willing to publicly call them out for human rights issues, for something like uh, the killing of Jamal Khashoggi, um, who has pulled support, the Biden administration has to some extent pulled support, um, logistic military support for the war in Yemen. So all of that, I think, um, has an impact on the calculation of Saudi Arabia. Obviously, I'm also not an expert on Saudi internal affairs, so I defer to Fouad or, and others for, for more details on that, Ali himself. But um, I think from the public messaging that we're seeing from the outside or from Tehran's viewpoint that uh, there has definitely been a shift in Saudis um, in the signals that they're sending publicly as far as their willingness to engage um, more with Tehran. I think part of that is out of necessity because they're seeing this shifting um, geopolitical landscape. Thanks, Nagar. So I, I have um, a question having to do with this notion, and I know that most or perhaps the first three panelists uh, agree that they think rapprochement will continue and to a certain extent they attribute that to the US indicating that perhaps it will play a less robust role in the region. I know Alex said he's, he's skeptical of over exaggerating that, that he thinks the US will remain. But I'm curious um, for anyone, including Ali, if they would like to weigh in on if the US does play a smaller role in the region, do we anticipate a larger role played by China or Russia or perhaps India? Uh, and what effects we think that might have Again, assuming that the US, which I, I don't necessarily think this is true, that the US would necessarily allow this to happen. But if it did, if the US really perhaps did get drawn into more conflict with China and might be forced to play a smaller role in the region, what other regional or international powers do we think might get involved and what effects would that have? Alex unmuted himself, so I'm going oh, to- Oh, no, I just wanted, sorry, thank you. I didn't want to push myself into it, but very quickly, look, if you are the Middle East, China is a fact of life. What do the Middle Eastern states by and large have a lot to sell? Oil and gas, who's the biggest cons consumer is China. So just that's just a structural reality and the trade will flow will continue going there. And I understand it, that China today is the biggest trading partner of every single state in, in the Middle East, every single state. For example, they get, I think three to four times more of their oil um, from Saudi Arabia than they do from Iran, which tells you something that this notion that we've heard a lot about that China and Iran are gonna team up and they're gonna push the United States out of the Middle East. It's another major uh, exaggeration in terms of what's really happening. But final point I make, and all is this, um, it's in the benefit of every Middle Eastern state to have maximum international uh, positive involvement in the region, the Russians, the Chinese, and also the Americans staying, the Europeans, and helping bring about the regional dialogue. If every big 
extra regional block of, of nations like the Europeans or the United States, China, they could help the region find that confidence and reduce suspicion in terms of bilateral relations that exist among the, the states in the region, then the region as a whole would benefit. Uh, uh, the opposite is that the rest of the world continues to see the Middle East as a place where you sell arms and military equipment. Uh, which unfortunately has been a big part of the reality in recent decades. That I think is terrible for the region. Then the region needs to think about the, the future in terms of economic empowerment and coexistence and not these zero sum uh, game competitions that dominated so much of the affairs of the region in the last couple of decades. Thanks, Alex. Definitely agree. Uh, just my, my two cents are yes, I, I think perhaps having a bigger role played by other international players might help contribute to more balance than what we've observed with the US playing such a, a sort of unbalanced role in the region. Um, did anyone else want to weigh in on that question of sort of the effects of a bigger role for China or Russia? Ali? Uh, I, I'm from the school to say that I don't know why uh, the U.S. or China or Russia has to play any role. Uh, and these these are grown uh, grown up people in in Tehran and Riyadh that they can figure out their own uh, decisions. Uh, I think w the region in general has suffered from interference from uh, major powers, and I think. Uh, if 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 the U.S. gets out of the way, if the uh, British get out of the way, uh, the, the Saudis and the Iranian uh, regimes will find it uh, uh, better for them to talk to each other directly and to figure out their own problems. These countries are not going to be able to move away from each other, so they have to deal with each other uh, in certain uh, manner, and I think that will reduce tension. I, uh, the U.S. has not uh, taken on the role of peacemaker in the region, uh, and maybe there is a little bit of it right now, but generally the American role has not been a peacemaker uh, is trying to diffuse conflict, uh, and even if they pretend to, to do that, that, that hasn't happened. So I think less international intervention uh, will, will serve uh, uh, the region in terms of uh, coming together and figuring the, their own problem and building trust between these uh, regimes who are very similar, to be honest, in their structures. Thanks. Definitely agree with you, Ali. So uh, I'm getting a note from our uh, our runner of show here that perhaps it's time to wind down, but I wanted to invite anyone else to offer any final thoughts either on that question or anything else that we didn't manage to circle back to. And if, if any of the audience members would like to throw in a question, now is your chance. Barbara? I would just like to say that I hope that the rulers in this part of the world will stop taking hostages, will accept uh, constructive criticism from their populations, and this goes for Iran, it goes for Saudi Arabia, Bahrain, UAE, all of them. Uh, the models that they have chosen, even if there is some economic growth, are not sufficient to ensure stability as long as many, many people in these countries feel that their voices cannot be heard. Um, and it's, uh, I hope that MBS has learned his lesson and I have my doubts about Iran, but I hope that they begin to learn that lesson too. Thanks, Barbara. Dr. Fouad, did you wanna go? I think you're muted. But oh, we, we can't hear you. Uh, yes, with regard to the Chinese role and the general regional politics. I think the Chinese are present in the region, um, but as a kind of partner, uh, they are the, the, the biggest oil uh, importer of the, uh, uh, and, uh, from the region. Uh, they, they import about five, five million or four, four million uh, barrel a day from Saudi Arabia. Uh, but they, they are, they don't have military presence in the region and they will not be allowed because this is the part of the, the conflict between China, China and United States. Even economically, actually they are not, uh, they are not allowed even to, to invest um, in, in, in Lebanon economy. And uh, 
and I, I am, I'm very close to some, some sources here, the official sources that the, the, the Chinese offer, the, 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 the Lebanese economy, uh, 10 million, 10 billion dollars investment. And they, they said, uh, but in one condition you have, we, we have to have uh, the American permission. Also, they, they are not allowed to invest in Syria uh, until now, uh, side by side of the region as well. They are not allowed to, to, to invest uh, in re 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 reconstruction uh, project in, in Syria. So uh, I think the Americans, yes, they, they are shifting to Eurasia, but they still have very heavy military presence and they are the main and the major player in regional and politics. If I may, just to, to wrap up, uh, is that right? Oh, well, I, may, I might go to Nagar next and then have you get the final word, Alex, if that's okay. all right. Thank you. I just wanted to echo what Barbara said um, as far as domestic um, repression and crackdown on dissent. And I think this also is connected to these regional rivalries, the securitization, at least in the case of Iran that I'm looking at closely, the securitization of the state, this form of a brutal and um, you know, very violent crackdown on various forms of um, anti-government protests and dissent. And I think um, moving into a direction of reducing tensions and rapprochement and dialogue with, with neighbors is going to have positive effects on uh, Iran's domestic affairs and this uh, sort of uh, very closed and um, you know sad situation that we've been observing that just keeps getting worse. Thank you. Thanks, Nagar. I think that's a very good point, sort of tying internal repression to external rivalries or tensions. All right, Alex, final word. Thanks. Yeah, Nagar didn't want to jump in there. I, I thought uh, it was a free for all. So sorry for that. Um, look, I, I just want to make the following point. Uh, Ayatollah Khamenei could live another 20 years, the Supreme Leader of Iran, uh, but he's 82. And uh, I think if he's thinking about his legacy, he would do the country of Iran, the people of Iran, the region a huge favor by being far more explicit about why it's important to reach out to your neighbors and, and, and de-escalate across the board. 10 years after Arab Spring unfolded, 10 years after Iran got involved in various places in Syria and then Yemen and so forth, it's extremely important that he, because he's the only one who can lead the nation down this path uh, the most smooth way possible. Because once he says it, at least one faction, the dominant faction, the so-called hardline faction will follow him. This could be something he could do. This could, I think it, history will judge him well if he decided to do it. Alternatively, he can leave um, the, the, this life uh, where we are now and that would just make it harder for us to predict, predict what would come after Khamenei. But he has a chance here while he's still, still alive to say this is good for, for Iran, for the region, and he should be much more, uh, you know, explicit about it. instead of, you know, for us having to second guess him, he can come out and say, he could come out and say, this is good, we should do it. Uh, and not just on the regional front, I think he could do it also in terms of relations with the United States, which he obviously fears uh, because he, he thinks the Americans are ultimately again after regime change. But if you can convince him otherwise, then he should also say that actually reducing tensions with the likes of the United States also benefits Iran and the region. So again, to a point I made repeatedly over the course of the last hour and a half, it requires political uh, you know, determination and boldness uh, to really uh, go forward and, and make things look different uh, from how they have looked in, in, in recent years. Thank you. Thanks so much, Alex. And I think I would add that it would be great to see uh, similar efforts at reconciliation from other regional leaders, uh, as well as perhaps from the United States. So just a final thank you to all of our panelists. It's been a real pleasure for me, Vinny, thanks to the Institute for Gulf Affairs for hosting this and to our audience for joining us. Thanks so much. <laughs>